whatever movies Stanley made, what I love about his work is they are completely conscious. You may like them, you may not like them, you may say, well, what about this, that, or the other thing? But, you know, everybody pretty much acknowledges he's the man, and uh, I still feel that underrates him. <laughs> Kubrick's next project looked far more commercial. With Stephen King's best-selling novel, The Shining, he seized the chance to make a film that would both satisfy him artistically and meet the demands of the box office. I'm asking about The Shining, you know, it's such unusual. He says, well, in reality, this is an optimistic picture. And I said, on, on, on what, what basis, Stanley? And he said, as the, prag, you know, the existential, pragmatic man that he was, he said, well, in some way, this movie's about ghosts. Anything that says there's anything after death is an optimistic story. There are still images in The Shining that I wake up screaming about. That little boy in the hall and the tracking of the steady cam. The little boy on the bicycle. Of the little boy. The sense of movement that that gave that picture inside this very, very foreboding place. <laughs> You know that something is building up in this place, and the the way the um, it's the blandness, let's say, of uh, the people, how quiet they are. And... Is Tony the one that tells you things? Yes. How does he tell you things? It's like I go to sleep, and he shows me things, but when I wake up, I can't remember everything. Has Tony ever told you anything about this place? About the Overlook Hotel? It's holding back this extraordinarily emotional, powerful, dramatic punch that's going to happen. You know it's going to come somehow, and some, at some time. And it, it, it just creates such suspense. Is there something bad here? <laughs> At first, I was taken aback by some of the performance. And then, after the third or fourth viewing, um, I understood the, uh, the level of um, intensity uh, when Nicholson was doing. I'm not sure that that is intended to be what a typical horror movie is, which is a realistic portrayal of supernatural spookiness. I think that, that what's going on in that movie is largely going on in Jack Nicholson's head. Hi, Lloyd. A little slow tonight, isn't it? <laughs> yes, it is, Mr. Torrance. You know, I like the kind of film he makes. I don't need to be naturalistic in a film to feel satisfied as an actor. You know, one of the things he said to me that I've, I've always remembered was in movies you don't you don't try and photograph the reality. You try and photograph the photograph of the reality. And I knew it w wouldn't be a performance about idiosyncratic behaviorism, but that it would be, I always thought of it as balletic uh, in The Shining. Like another lesson was here, Jack. The script says, uh, Jack is not writing. Well, the question is, what is he doing? And I said, well, you know, Whenever I am inside a big empty place that you normally wouldn't be alone in, I always think of doing things that I might do outside, and that's where throwing that tennis ball all during the picture, and you know, it wound up being a big part of staging. It rolls into things, it's, it's thrown the length of hallways, you know, all of those kinds of things, and it's from those little things that he would develop sort of preconceived idiosyncrasy, you know, I mean, he always knew what he was going to get. He said often that every scene really has been done. Our job is always to do it just a little bit better. Mr. Grady, you were
were the caretaker here. I'm sorry to differ with you, sir. But you are the caretaker. You've always been the caretaker. I should know, sir. I've always been here. We had a, we had a good, good, friendly relationship, you know. I mean, he, you know, he'd turn on you in a moment and say, all right, you know, you're the big fella, let's see it. You know, I mean, that's about as harsh as he ever got with me. You know, I mean, he was a completely different director with Shelley. Right. Oh, come on. What do you mean, roll Two video? Seconds. We're fucking killing ourselves out here, and you're going to be ready. I am too. I'm standing right by the door. So we play mood music? No, I can't. Yeah, but when you came out like this, you said, just. Oh, no, 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 he can do some pretty cruel things when you're filming. Because it seemed to me at times that the end justified the means. Here's Johnny. It was a very difficult role. It was a long shoot, and I had to cry and hyperventilate and carry a little boy and run, you know, for most of the time we shot. And that was about a year, a little over a year. And anywhere between 30 and 50 videotaped rehearsals before we even rolled film. I wouldn't trade the experience for anything. Why? Because of Stanley. And it was a fascinating learning experience. It was such intense work that I think it makes you smarter. But I wouldn't want to go through it again. We were working with the material that was in the book and trying to make music that fit the mood of a sort of updated Gothic horror story, which is what the Shining is really, I mean, as, as a novel in any case. And of course, the stylization that came out from the filming was not present in the book. And so we, we failed in our attempt, which is why there was a great deal of other music put into the movie. Danny, you win. Let's take the rest of this walking. Huh? Uh, a, a lot okay. of the music cues are combinations of some of Ligeti's music, some of Pendereski's music. <laughs> and lots of background patterns and textures with heartbeats and sizzling uh, electronic little weird sounds. And those were all mixed together. That's how Stanley finally did what he was looking for. When The Shining was released, the response was mixed. Some people appreciated its riddles and ambiguities. Others felt that Kubrick had strayed too far from Stephen King's book. When I say that the people who love Stanley's movies were mostly movie people, they're just looking at what's in the frame, what's the moviness of the movie. And they, of course, love Stanley, in a very, I find, in a very uncomplicated way. Whereas, you know, the, the, the critical community tends to fuss and, and fidget over, over what Stanley did. <laughs> And after The Shining, Kubrick and his family moved to a large rambling mansion in the Hertfordshire countryside. Except when filming on location, he would now do all his work here, supported by a small and dedicated team. The joke line we had about Stanley was, um, and this was the line you would never ever hear from Stanley, was, um, don't bother me with the details. I've got complete faith and trust in your judgment. Stanley would involve himself, I mean, to such an extent with, with the detail of, of, of stuff that one thought perhaps was a bit beneath him. He should have been doing major stuff and not worrying about how you had certain files in your office. I guess Stanley saw it all as a package deal. You either cared or you didn't care. When we went to Ireland on Barry Lyndon, he left this 15-page document, Care Instructions, how to look after the animals. 
and um, the 37th instruction is, if a fight should develop between Freddie and Leo, and that was a father and son tomcats that we had, the only way that you can do anything about it is to dump water on them. Try to grab Freddie and run out of the room with him. Do not try and pick up Leo. Alternatively, if you open a door and just let Freddie get out, he can outrun Leo. But if he's trapped in a place where you can't separate them, just keep dumping water, shouting, screaming, jumping up and down and distracting him, waving shirts, towels, just try and get them apart and grab Freddy. I remember once he had a cat that was drinking excessively and I said, well, perhaps you can measure how much that cat's drinking, Stanley. And he said, uh, no, that's impossible. There are too many cats. And then he phoned back a couple of minutes later and he said, but I could count the number of laps. And he then said, now, how much does each lap take up in terms of water? I said, I don't think there's any information on that. He said, well, leave it with me. I'll try and find out. And he'd go off and he'd try and find out from somewhere and then he'd work it out and we'd have a figure. You know, he was compulsive in that sort of way. He was a kind of ultimate Jewish mother. If an animal was ill, or if one of us were ill, I mean, Stanley, Stanley was like Superman. I was very, very ill myself for quite a while, and, and he was so sweet, so, so kind, so loyal. I mean, everything you want somebody to be, you know, he was. I mean, he was really, really kind. Um, however, I mean, when you weren't ill, that's when you bought it. <laughs> he very seldom praised you because he had this obsession that if he praised you, you would fall to pieces and not do the job right. He, he knew how far he could push you. That was the other clever thing. Occasionally, he pushed you a bit too far and then he was a bit confused why you were really angry. Philosophically, he was just no nonsense. You know, honest, had his view very cool view of humanity. He was a warm guy at home. I mean, I'm sure everybody says that, crazy about animals and, you know, but could be brutal with people that he worked with. You know, I mean, he wasn't all that way. I mean, sometimes he could be, he could be generous as well, but he, you know, he felt everybody was an opponent. <laughs> you know, whether, how, no matter what, he wasn't sure they weren't, didn't have an agenda of their own and, he wasn't going to have that on his pictures.